Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Chris Gregg uh, to the Super Speaker Series uh, today. Uh, Chris is the Dow Chair in Sustainable Engineering Innovation at the University of Queensland in Australia, but also since uh, this July and for the next two years, he's also a visiting uh, scholar, visiting fellow in Energy and Environment uh, at the Andrews Center. Uh, in Queensland, uh, he's a professor of chemical engineering and director of the Dow Center for Sustainable Engineering Innovation. Uh, and uh, by training as a chemical engineer, he got both his undergraduate and PhD at the University of Queensland. Uh, and he's a fellow of the Australian Academy of Technolo Technological Sciences and Engineering. Uh, he joined the university in 2011 uh, in a somewhat atypical fashion, uh, a typical career director. He spent 25 uh, years actually in the industry. Uh, started out as a startup yeah, after his uh, undergraduate uh, and uh, PhD, and, uh, but then uh, sold the company uh, to a major international engineering company. And since then, he has spent time uh, both in executive uh, and uh, project management uh, at a variety of companies uh, in the resource and energy industries international. He was CEO and project director of Zero Gen, which is a large scale carbon capture and storage project. Uh, and his time at uh, the University of Queensland, he also has continued uh, to keep a uh, finger in the industry. He has been the non-executive director uh, with many uh, Australian stock exchange companies. Uh, he has been deputy chairman of Gladstone Ports Corporation, which is one of Australia's largest energy export hubs. And he remains as the director of the Energy Policy Institute of Australia. Uh, in terms of uh, academic research, uh, his main interests lie in energy transitions, economics and policy, uh, energy for development, and industrial mega project implementation and the carbon capture and storage. He publishes in journals like uh, utilities policy, uh, energy policy, energy research and social sciences. Uh, and uh, since this July, as I mentioned already, he's been here at the Animal Center. He's spearheading uh, a big multidisciplinary initiative uh, called Rapid Switch. Uh, and he's going to tell us more about that uh, and related projects, you know, all of which are designed to put the different uh, sciences and social sciences uh, different countries uh, and, and, and different approaches together uh, to spearhead a more rapid uh, energy transition towards decarbonization. Thank you. Thanks, Elke. And uh, my first two slides are kind of just going to summarise what Elke just said, but I am a very unconventional academic. Uh, actually, it, was, it turns out it was a bit more than 25 years. So the first three decades of my life were shaped by by an industry career. So my, I have no deep disciplinary uh, or, or kind of research expertise. I, when I was doing my PhD, I formed a startup company uh, which commercialised a sugar centrifuge of all things, uh, which actually became the, the most popular selling centrifuge in the world for the sugar industry. Um, so that then got us excited. We, we had a few other kind of inventions around the sugar industry. And we went from really an OECD focus to a developing world focus. So building turnkey sugar projects in developing countries, mainly Southeast Asia, but also in Africa and uh, Latin America. And once, once I sold that company, uh, then I had to find something else to do because I was restricted from competing. Uh, so I came back to Australia and joined the energy sector and went from what was a, I guess, a small to medium history, sized company history to large corporate history. Uh, and, and really the energy sector, and dare I say it, coal and gas primarily, uh, was my focus, um, developing thermal coal mines, thermal coal power stations, but ultimately CCS. Uh, and so this is kind of what shapes me. I had a year break as a, as a full-time carer in between, and then that actually decided, I decided that I should do something important, and I became an academic. So that happened in, at the end of uh, 2011. And so there are sort of five connected, sort of connected research interests I have. Energy and development, so what, how energy and livelihoods interact. Energy and the environment, uh, energy systems generally, and carbon capture and storage. Uh, particularly its connection with heavy industry as a decarbonisation technology. But mostly uh, that, that career has this underlying framing of how rapidly can big systems change. When you, whether you've got to build infrastructure, whether you've got to get public acceptance of things, whether you've got to get the politics right, how fast can we make big scale systems change? 
So, um, and here's the problem. So this is the work of one of my PhD students who's, who's now graduated, but this is Human Development Index on the, on the vertical axis uh, from 1990 to 2014 and the tons of, per, per, of CO2 per capita um, on the, on the x-axis. And so you can see here India, China, US, Australia up there at, at, at the worst in the world. And I'm just going to go back and show that again. And you can see China and India emerging in that two decades. China going from low human development to medium to high. Uh, and so the interesting thing is that everybody progresses in this sort of fashion. There's never been a, a nation where we've sort of made our way to where we actually need to be in a two degree C world, which is right up in this corner here. So, so that's, that's kind of why this is important. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is energy and development, and particularly energy access in developing countries. So um, this was one of the first uh, things I set up at UQ. And it was really to say, um, I want us to focus on the developing world. We are totally obsessed with OECD problems. Um, that's not where this battle is going to be won and lost. Of course, trying to motivate academics of different disciplines into something completely new uh, turns out to be a bit hard, or it turned out to be hard for me anyway. Uh, and then the, one of the first lessons I, met, I learned was what does motivate them was money. So I actually made a gift to the university and said the only, the only way you can have this gift if it's focused on non-OECD countries, developing countries, particularly India, if it is multidisciplinary and involves social scientists, and behavioural scientists and economists and engineers working together, and if it is matched one for one with industry and one for one by the university itself. And in the end we raised a million dollars. So that got us kicked off. We've hired, we've had 12 PhD students through across lots of different, different disciplines and in fact, to my surprise, the fewest uh, participants have been engineers. Um, and we've done lots of work. All of these students spend at least three to six months per year in India or more recently in Africa and PNG. Uh, and so, and we've graduated four PhDs. And I'm going to just talk about one of those uh, projects. And, and it's really the cooking transition, because that's, we all hear about electrification, but there's this cooking problem, and I'm sure you all know it too, uh, where people rely on biomass for, for cooking. Um, you know, uh, four and a half million premature deaths a year, affects three billion people in the world almost. Um, the trudgery is of collecting fuel wood is, is impacted on women. Uh, and despite decades, so when I was working in Southeast Asia in the early 90s, there were about three billion people cooking with, with uh, these sorts of things. Um, today it's about three billion people. So despite decades of intervention, despite billions of dollars of intervention, we don't seem to be reducing the numbers materially. So one of my students, uh, Ewan Malakar, who was a social scientist, so it's a weird kind of thing. I, I don't get to supervise students directly. I'm a co-advisor always. So usually there's somebody with the deep disciplinary expertise that's on the team, principal advisor, and I'm there really for the contextual side. But Ewan was interested in what social systems or how social systems affect people's choice of cooking uh, and what holds people back, families in particular, from a complete transition. So a lot of these uh, interventions saw us push LPG cookstoves into the, into the community, but they don't get used. And so wh why don't people just abandon traditional systems? And one of his case study areas was Chittor village in Andhra Pradesh, where 90% of households still use traditional cooking, despite the fact that most of them have been given LPG. And so his starting assumptions were, well, firstly, probably electricity is inaccessible. And, and part of these study, starting assumptions was through discussions with people, government people in India and other academics, that LPG suppliers would be too far to be able to provide a reliable supply chain, and that in any case that LPG would be too expensive. The reality was that every house was electrified in that village and every household had a connection. There were willing LPG distributors. There was a, a viable market and they were available within 15 miles. 
and nearly every household had a television, a cable television connection, uh, which turned out to be more expensive on a monthly basis than, than running LPG. And so, thinking about why this transition was, was so hard to stick, the, the four themes that, that Ewan found was that really, firstly, cooking was a sampradayam. So this was kind of the Hindu tradition. Our ancestors did it, we must did it. Cooking with biomass, cooking with fuel wood, this is our way. Second one was that the, there were synergies with their traditional income generation. So, um, for example, uh, they had to, um, they were graziers, right? So they would take their goats to the, to the forest each day to graze them, and so they might as well come back with timber for cooking. And, and finally, some of them were uh, agricultural farmers, peanuts, tomatoes, etc., and they needed stakes to actually support the crop, and therefore they might as well, they were collecting firewood anyway, so why not? Gender norms, so there was a, an embarrassment for males who would cook, and therefore they had no role in this process, and as a result, there was no willingness to spend on this process. And then finally, the sense of belonging. So as a community, they would collect firewood together. And so despite a decade of having people trying to influence these villages to switch to LPG, no progress had been made. I have another student who was looking at where progress had been made and what, what might have promoted that. And he in, in, was looking at a, a tiger reserve in Maharashtra. And so what, what he found there as a base case was that the, nobody really understood the implications of energy poverty in terms of the health and so forth. Um, the issues were around human activity and its, and its interface with the forest and the tiger population. And so over time, as the forest became depleted due to fuel wood collection, tigers were, were more and more coming into the village for, for water, for food, etc. And these encounters were leading to death. So in the period from 2010, there was a tenfold increase in the, in the mortality rate through tiger attacks. So what's happened there in the space of just three years was a 90% penetration rate of LPG that has stuck. And it's been institutionally driven by the Maharashtra Forestry Department, which had it began in, in, in the 19th and first part of the 20th century, um, really focused on extraction, so harvesting forest woods and so forth for commercial purposes. Then in the latter part of the 20th century, they moved to more of a uh, conservation focus and protecting the forest and wildlife. Um, but it was a policing approach, right? Very much about relocation of villages, stopping villages from, their, from interacting. In the 21st century, that moved to more of an incentives participatory approach. So they were both motivated in the end. From the, from the forestry is very much an environmental focus, but from the uh, villages, it was about reducing the drudgery of fuel wood collection and the prestige of using modern cooking. No environmental motive whatsoever. So, so quite opposite motivations. And key to this was the institutional leadership from the Forestry Department, both the, 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 the General Director of the Forestry Department in the state, who, who really had a vision for environmental protection, and then the local leadership who, who really drove this uh, community participatory development approach. So, you know, what, what um, the policy lessons here are is that the innovations, the interventions over it for cooking have been largely a technology push and they failed because they don't take into account the social context, they don't take into account social norms, Benef co-benefits are not understood and they're often implemented as a standalone. So the ADB, for example, put 40 million cook stoves into India at one point, but less than 10% are used. But rapid and, tr and uh, sustainable transitions are possible if they are participatory with the affected communities, involve multi-level institutional leadership, and the co-benefits are understood, immediate, and significant. So that's sort of one of the things I was interested in, and, and particularly at the, in the developing world, and that bring, brings forward to me the importance of the developing world. Um, but now I want to talk about 
really the global energy transition. Uh, and, and it's begun with that. There is no doubt about this, right? Um, and, and it's really supported by these scenarios, whether they are produced by bottom-up analysis, top-down analysis, but this is the, insta uh, the International Energy Agency scenarios from 2017. A 2 degrees C scenario, a beyond 2 degrees C scenario, which is a nominally 1.7 or so. And basically all of these involve the smooth transition of uh, agriculture, power, transport, industry and buildings. And they look smooth and they are basically backcast. So we know where we need to be, we backcast with the lowest cost technologies that might get us there. But in fact, there are bottlenecks, and this is not a smooth transition. This is a very disruptive, uh, very rapid transformation. We've not bent the curve in terms of this rapid rise in, in, in emissions to date, but n within the next few years, we are expecting to actually halt that, that rise and set ourselves on an immediate uh, reduction of emissions. Now, with rapid change, and, and this is something that really threw out in my uh, industry career, when we go for rapid change in, in, in uh, infrastructure systems, we hit bottlenecks. They come in lots of different forms, but they're almost inevitable. And in particular, when the transition clashes with the economic agenda, when that climate ambition clashes with the economic development in, uh, agenda, I think bottlenecks are even more inevitable. So if we want to think about bottlenecks, it needs to be cross-disciplinary thinking. So we, I started here when I first started to think about, you know, what are the obstacles to global decarbonisation? I'm an industrialist, first and foremost. And I thought about material supplies. I thought about manufacturing capacity. I thought about some of the um, ge geological resources and so forth. And each case, you find bottlenecks. For, for, for most of the important transitions around the world, you find some form of bottlenecks of those nature. But you also find that you potentially will expose shortages in organisational capacity to deliver these changes. So whether it's skills for solar PV deployment, whether it's ge um, petroleum engineers for CCS, etc., nuclear welders, and so on. And then we find lots and lots of social and behavioural and political bottlenecks. Um, regulatory uh, Im immaturity in certain technologies in certain regions. And ultimately, market design and capital flows in the economy become quite critical. And, ca and they're all interconnected, so capital availability becomes very scarce when the regula regulatory frameworks are not in place, where political support is not in place, or where public opposition to technologies exists. And so what Rapid Switch was about was to try and say, is there a way that we can examine these bottlenecks, uh, look at how we might resolve them as a way to A, accelerate the pace of uh, climate mitigation, but B, to design uh, more realistic pathways? So, um, today I would like to just unpack for a bit this purple wedge, which is the power sector wedge. Now effectively built into here are really three things. A reduction in energy intensity, so end use efficiency. Renewable energy, particularly wind and uh, solar. And some other dispatchable forms like nuclear, CCS, hydro. So base, more or less in, in a group of three, even relatively evenly, although more emphasis is on improved en en uh, efficiency. So, how do we decide where the, where the biggest exposure or the biggest vulnerability to bottlenecks might be? So we decided we should have some sort of framework for assessing bottlenecks. And on this, this, this here is the, 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 clean, uh, the uh, energy productivity challenge, right? So this is the energy intensity. And on the y-axis, we've plotted the percent reduction in energy intensity. Think about megajoules per dollar of GDP. Uh, percent reduction from, tw from now to 2060. And on this axis is the actual energy intensity in 2060. Um, and it's a, it's a reverse scale, right? Because I was trying to make the 
the more challenging parts look in the north, north uh, top, top right quadrant. Again, this is the IEA scenario, so it's really trying to see within that scenario where are the bottlenecks uh, likely to emerge. And the other thing to keep eye an eye on is the size of the bubble. The bubble size reflects the greenhouse gas contribution, mitigation contribution of that particular transition. So, so the US, uh, and I'm just focusing on the four big emitting regions, US, Europe, China and India. So the US is, is expected under that scenario to get about a 65% reduction in energy intensity. So a 65% improvement in, in energy productivity and end, its, end at somewhere around 1.65 megajoules per dollar of GDP. So 65% improvement down to 1.6. Europe is going to get about the same level of improvement but it starts from a better position and gets below 1.2 megajoules per dollar of GDP. And you can see Europe doesn't have as big an impact if it doesn't happen compared to the US. And then China. China's expected to get an 80% reduction in energy intensity and a huge impact. And it, and it gets to almost the level of Europe uh, by 2060. And there's India a similar reduction in energy intensity and expected to be the world's most productive, energy productive economy by 2060. So what happens here is that we've placed great expectations on the developing countries to lead the world in energy productivity. Now there's a couple of, there's a couple of assumptions behind that as to why it may or may not be reasonable. Um, one is that they're starting with less infrastructure, so in theory there's an opportunity to build more efficient infrastructure from the beginning. There's also an inherent assumption that India um, will bypass the traditional in heavy industrial type uh, economic development and go more to directly to a services economy. But that's at odds with the policy speak in India now, which is very much driven on a make in India type uh, basis. So, so a lot of the transitions, this energy transition that is expected for India, the Indian government will say it will only happen if we are making these in India. We cannot afford to remain a capital importing country. So, so I think there are serious potential bottlenecks to be explored in the pace and the extent to which we can improve the energy productivity uh, in India over this time frame. And whatever, whatever we don't achieve in those, in those targets puts more pressure on something else. The, the next area I wanted to explore was um, e electricity generation and the different technologies. Uh, again, looking at the vulnerability to bottlenecks. Now, on the, on the y-axis this time, it's how much we have to scale up a particular technology. So the electric electricity generation per annum in 2060 for a particular technology divided by what it is today. So it's a log scale. And on the x-axis is the rate of installation that we would have to achieve to get there divided by the fastest rate that has ever been installed anywhere in the world previously. So in the US, if we take wind, for example, we have to scale up about eight times from where we are today. But to do so, we only have to go at about the pace Europe has gone um, in the last 10 years. So it looks quite plausible. And in the case of nuclear, there's not much to be done or not much expected to be done. And it's much slower than you did here uh, in the 70s and 80s and that France has done. Um, PV gets more challenging, you have to scale up by a factor of 30 and go twice as fast as, the, as China has done or the Europeans have done or Australia has done. In the, in the case of the U, EU, it's a similar story. Offshore wind's a bit challenging, wind is not particularly challenging. Uh, in the, U, U, uh, in the uh, US, concentrating solar power is a bit challenging uh, in terms of historical rates. 
But then we get to China, and again, bubble sizes are much bigger, so the implications of their transitions are bigger. Um, but again, you know, wind and nuclear, they're sitting down in this part of the world. It's, it's a big scale up, 10 times, but perhaps it's achievable. PV and concentrating solar panels are getting, power, sorry, is getting more challenging, moving up in this direction. And then we get to India. And see, what we see in India is huge expectations on solar. Scaling up of 100 times for PV and 1,000 times, although it's coming off a low base, uh, but going five times faster, eight times faster than has ever been achieved anywhere in the world. And so there, that's the sort of part of the, part of the place, or the, the key bottleneck that I would look for. One technology that's not on this graph is CCS. And the reason it's not on this graph is because it would be way off the scale. Partly because it's a divide by zero problem, we've done very little of it anywhere. <laughs> so th this suggests, that, by the way, just because you're not up in this part of the world doesn't make this less challenging. Increasing Chinese nuclear deployment by a factor of 10 is, is, a, is a huge challenge. Uh, most of the good sites have been taken. The next round of uh, nuclear deployment in China will start to move inland and so water shortages and some public opposition issues might emerge. But I think almost, and, and, and being up in this part of the graph doesn't mean you can't do it, but it mean, it's just a, a one way of determining whether we might be more vulnerable to bottlenecks and it needs a, a much more stronger look. The final one was when you take into account that end use efficiency and you take into account the penetration of those other <coughs> technologies, What's happening is a phasing out of coal, in the, particularly in the developing world, but it's a phasing out of fossil fuels. It's a transition from fossil fuels to a more efficient economy and more renewables. So on this graph, we're looking at the percentage of coal in the current mix in that, in that country. And on this axis, we're looking at the lost generation from early retirements. Now we're defining an early retirement as a retirement that occurs before 40 years which is a bit conservative considering the average historical age of retirement is 55 years. But, but it's, it's, it's a reasonable expectation. Most uh, NPV calculations and uh, financial analysis for coal plants would have been done with a 40-year life. <coughs> so, and, then, and we measure the, the, uh, the early retirement risk by gigawatt years. So think about a, a major coal plant is about a gigawatt that retires a year early, that's one gigawatt year of, of early retirement risk. So in the US, we're almost 40% coal in the mix these days. This is not 2018, it's about 2015. And the expectation is if, if, all of the, if we're going to achieve a two degrees C under the IEA scenario, then the US will have about 25 gigawatt years of early retirement exposure. Europe is a less uh, dominant coal position in, the, in, in its electricity market, but it's younger on average, and it has about 100 gigawatt years of early retirement exposure. And then you get to China, which is getting up towards 80%, 70% in the electricity market, but it's at almost a 10,000 gigawatt year. So if you think about that, the, the, the current coal fleet in, in China is about 900 gigawatts, so it's basically retiring all of their assets 10 years early or half of their assets 20 years early. And in fact, what the scenario looks like is about the most recent half of their assets being retired at age 20, whereas historically they've been retiring at age 45. And India is a similar story. It's not as big an economy, it doesn't have as many coal plants, but they have to retire even earlier. <coughs> so, you know, there will be a financial cost to this early retirement. It's around about $700 billion globally, but importantly, about 90% of it is in the developing countries. So largely China, India, and ASEAN countries. There's not just a, fin a financial exposure, so there's a socioeconomic cost as well. Uh, in a ca country like India, the places where the coal industry is dominant, both for mining, for power production and for the industrial users of that power, 
uh, is not in the same regions as where solar PV will be deployed, which is going to be the d dominant uh, technology that replaces it. And so there's likely to be a significant social disruption to employment, and there's likely to be significant political pushback. And these are the sort of bottlenecks that, that we would like to explore as part of the Rapid Switch project. Um, CCS, so you know, I spent the last five or six years of my career trying to develop a CCS project. We spent uh, $150 million on, on the feasibility study and exploration for um, safe economic CO2 storage, subsurface storage, um, and we made a decision to kill the project on economic grounds, on really a lack of consistent policy, which those familiar with Australia would be aware of. We've changed, changed Prime Ministers seven times in ten years, largely over energy and climate <laughs> policy. Um, so the question is, what's the potential for CCS to re carbon capture and storage, for those who are not familiar, to reduce the risk uh, to early retirement of fossil fuel assets? So um, CCS is not an easy project to develop, uh, type of project to develop. They are nearly always mega projects, so they're multi-billion dollar projects and they're long, uh, long lead times. So what we did is un unpack the CCS elements behind the IEA scenarios. And what you find is there's about 7 billion tonnes a year of CO2 being injected into the subsurface by 2060. So put, con put uh, 7 billion tonnes a year into context, it's about the scale of the global oil and gas production today. And CO2 storage is a very similar sort of process to oil and gas production. You, you, the same process is to find the resources, the same process is to drill out the assets and to produce. So it's kind of like oil and gas production but in reverse. <coughs> and this graph shows you that it's dominated by uh, China, uh, India, EU and, and uh, the US, with a little bit less for, um, for ASEAN countries. This is the rest of the world, Russia, Middle East, etc. Uh, and and the C where the CO2 is going is it's from industry, so that's largely cement, steel, ammonia, uh, power, and then other which is um, oil and gas type refining, uh, biofuels, distilleries, etc. The other thing to remember is the 7 billion tonnes a year doesn't include the BECs, the, the bioenergy with CCS, so the negative emissions technologies which are scheduled to come in in the second half of the year. That more than doubles that expectation. But it's a very rapid ramp up and the question is how, how realistic is that? So, so the way I frame this question is what, what's the potential geological storage of CO2 to meet that, uh, that, that, that scale up of CCS? And one way we might think about this, given the, 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 like, the similarities to oil and gas production, is what's, looking at, at, at historical and projected oil and gas production as a kind of an analogue or, or a proxy for what you might be able to do with CO2 storage. So this is the US plotting the, the historical and projected oil production and natural gas production. And this is the expectation for CCS in a 1.5, uh, 2, 2 degree C scenario and a 1.5 degree C scenario. So the key thing I take from that graph is that CCS expectations in the United States are a kind of a significant, but they're a fraction of historical oil and gas capability. And I think this is a kind, of, one of the reasons why I think this is meaningful is that it's a reflection of the geological qualities and resources that you have but it's also a reflection of the availability of drilling rigs, petroleum engineers, regulation and so forth, and, and really also the public support for these sorts of uh, um, operations that you might achieve. But then we move to China firstly, and then India, and what we see is that the expectations for CCS are more or less double what historical and projected oil and gas capability has been. That to me looks extremely challenging, um, particularly when today there's virtually no exploration and, and appraisal activity to characterise what CO2 resources might be available in these countries. <coughs> 
And when you look at the time frames, that's really significant because this work has to be going on now if you want to be able to develop these projects. And in this next graph or, pic or pictorial, this is something we developed after the Zero Gen project because in the early days of CCS, none of us really knew what we were supposed to do. We had, we had power type people and industrial type people trying to develop these projects. And we all started with let, what, what sort of factory are we going to build, what sort of capture facilities, what pipeline will we build. And we didn't think much about whether the resources were there. But in fact, it's a very complicated process which involves circa three to five years and 50 to 100 million dollars of exploration and appraisal before you're even in a position to decide if you have a valid place to store CO2. And, and then it's not that you have a valid place, that you have something that you have a reasonable level of confidence in. At that point, we can think about a scoping study for a, for a project, and that's only going to take one to two, million, two years and up probably two to five million dollars. When we go into the next phase, we're now going to spend another three years and at least a hundred million dollars, often two hundred million dollars, appraising sites for, 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 for uh, injection, doing our field development planning and getting the environmental approvals and licences in place. On the, on the flip side for the plant, it's two to three years and maybe twenty to hundred million dollars in feasibility study. But the bottom line is, before we've made an investment decision in a CCS project, we've spent something between 250 and 600 million dollars and on the storage side, we haven't taken into account the potential for failure. So it's like any resource, you drill it out and you may find it or you may not. So usually you've got a portfolio of these being done in parallel. But, it turned, but, it, but the, the key is that there are hundreds of millions of dollars to be spent per project to develop CCS. And in the case of India and China, there is an expectation that there will be thousands of projects running in 2060, and in fact projects running in 2020. And for that to happen, there needs to be hundreds of millions of dollars dedicated to CO2 storage appraisal right now. The US is a slightly easier case. You have an extensive, very mature oil and gas industry. You have great acceptance for onshore oil and gas activities and you'll, you'll have no trouble developing onshore CO2 storage, um, to a point at least. And then of course once you, once you make an investment decision in a CCS project, they are typically you know, five years to build and they're typically multi-billion dollar projects. So, so there's a lot of governance issues in dealing with those. So, the, so, so that's a kind of a, a snapshot of, of rapid switch. Um, and really, uh, what's the policy rationale for it? This, this, is, this transformation is going to be enormous in terms of the engineering and infrastructure systemic change, but also in terms of the social change. And developing economies are clearly at the epicenter. They, they have the most to contribute to the greenhouse gas mitigation. Um, and and the, the developed countries have a much more serious role in terms of helping that process than I think we currently allow. Bottlenecks and unintended consequences will be inevitable. Uh, and what we hope is that rapid switch would help us better guide policy by anticipating these bottlenecks and helping to resolve them. Um, by being able to foresee the, the challenges of social change, whether they belong to nuclear acceptance or, or carbon storage acceptance, uh, or even just increased pricing and demand side behavioural change. Looking at the broader economic consequences, understanding the supply of skills and expertise that we would need to make this transition, and, and giving guidance to where we should be investing in innovation, and where investment decision making. The great, a great case in point was the CCS. We need to be spending that money now. And hopefully we get to arrive at some more realistic energy transitions. Perhaps they won't be for two degrees C. Perhaps we'll have to compromise on that given the pace constraint that we face. Um, finally, I wanted to just go back to some work that uh, another of my students did, um, Andrew Pascal. <coughs> 
And basically, returning to this curve, this is 2014, and you see that the, from the developing countries to India to China, some of the European countries in the United States, and this is, again is Human Development Index and tons of CO2 per capita. Uh, and I'm singling out China, Sweden, and the US because I think there is some policy guidance that we, or policy things that we need to change around how we attribute, attribute CO2 emissions and, and, and responsibility for change. So the first thing uh, Andrew did was to unpack these into quintiles of population. And so if you just, so that was the whole country, that's around a billion people. This is uh, by quintile, so these are now 200, the, the scale of the bubbles has changed. And here's China, the US and, and Sweden. And so what's striking here is when we, when we unpack a nation by quintile, we see that in China, for example, there's 400 million people who have a more carbon intensive lifestyle than the poorest half of the United States. And in fact, um, there's 200 million people in China with an emissions intensity which is greater than the average or the median of the United States. And Sweden, of course, looks particularly good. And in fact, even has the bottom quartile of the quintile of its population in, the, in that very sustainable zone for a two degree C world. So, so basically, sub, by, by breaking it down to a sub-national level and by bringing it back to individual behaviours, we're actually seeing some discrepancies and some inequalities which the richest people in China are not held to the level of account as, the rich, as, as even the poorest people in the US, but they have a much more carbon intensive lifestyle. What Andrew then did was to say these are the tons of CO2 attributed based on their territorial production. So this is the, the emissions produced in that country. Now he's gone to uh, consumption based CO2 accounting. So what you see here then is China goes backwards, US goes um, to a more carbon intensive position and Sweden goes to a, a more carbon intensive sit situation. And what this is exposing is emissions offshoring. So we're basically exporting our emissions. Yes, on principle, Sweden looks particularly attractive, but what it's doing is sending a lot of its manufacturing offshore to China. Uh, and in fact, China looks not as bad as it did when we looked at a production base. Oops. So just going that again. And I think there's some lessons in here as to how we should attribute the responsibility for CO2 emissions if we're going to get the desired action without the unintended consequences. So the policy lessons here is that almost all international policy is based on um, attributing in-country production emissions uh, at a national level, aggregated at a national level. And what we fail to do is address the link between income, lifestyles and emissions intensive consumption. And I think that w we won't solve this problem unless, and this is a personal opinion, we end up with national policies and universal ones that encourage a reduction in emissions intensive consumption <coughs> at an individual level, uh, regardless of the country where those emissions are generated. Um, so that's kind of me. I made it in 45 minutes, so uh, um, I'd be happy to take any questions at all. Thank you. <coughs> yep. So, so Chris, I want, to, I want to focus on the, not surprisingly for me, on, on the political violation. Uh, what is it, and, and the dynamics, not your last part of the talk, Mr. Stanley, but uh, dynamics of a rapid, a rapid adjustment to the government. Uh, so wouldn't it make sense, from, from a political point of view, the difficult issues are always going to be distribution. It's when one set of agents are disadvantaged by change sure. and others are advantaged. And that's all, all over the yeah. all, all side. And that's what Connell did with Tulsi about. That's the last question. Who gets what? Who and how? Uh, so suppose that we were to think about a set of pathways 
laid out nuclear CCS, solar, wind, offshore, offshore, and the CCS, and anything else that comes along. Um, and we identified what the characteristic political blockages would be in each of these four societies we have uh, for each of these economies. For example, you imply that CCS political blockages in the U.S. will be probably small because the carbon intensive industries, oil firms, coal firms, will benefit from CCS and we have the capacity to do it and it's not going to disrupt uh, as much as uh, and others. Whereas getting a huge solar buildup without a solar industry lob that's large already lobbying might be more difficult. So would there be a way, it, does it make sense to try to map those potential political blockages uh, by, by country and by technology? I, I think for sure. I mean, um, I think politics are going to stand in the way of the political obstacles. are going to stand in the way of most of these transitions in, in different forms in different countries. So, so I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think it, it is mandatory that you do it kind of on a country by country basis because the political, political systems are so different um, and the relationship between industry and, and policy makers is very different as well. So, well, as you know, it's one of the studies that I think um, uh, is something we should definitely do um, for this project. Um, and certainly in Australia, it's been, we're a tiny country, but it's been completely dysfunctional in terms of on again, off again carbon policy. And, and, it, and it, is, it is the, the absolute front line for all bipartisan uh, debate at the moment is energy and climate. Um, I wanted to ask about um, the possibility of the U.S. taking up some of the carbon capture, the U.S. oil and gas market, maybe making up for some of the unrealistic expectations in the uh, development. So, so I think there's two two parts in the way, uh, two, two ways that the US must play in carbon capture and storage. Firstly is, if it has the resources that we think it does, and almost certainly does, then it should be, A, doing more CCS here than perhaps is expected elsewhere, but potentially importing CO2. Uh, you know, I, don't, I think shipping CO2 to me looks a bit far-fetched. But certainly piping it from different countries might be in South America, for example, might be possible. Um, the more I think about CCS, and this is purely opinion with, with not too much evidence behind it, uh, other than the sort of analysis you do on CO2 storage, the more I think about it is I think CCS will actually be a domain of a few super, super resource powers like the Middle East and North Africa, the US, North America generally, um, the North Sea, uh, Russia, um, Russia who's doing nothing on CCS right now, but, uh, but it has enormous potential resources. And I don't see any significant amounts of CCS happening in, in India, for example, and very little in China. Um, so I think the role of those oil and gas major countries is probably going to be pretty central to CCS. Confident are we that we really can uh, store the CCS in some in these amounts in some reasonable way and in some way that it doesn't all get undone over time? Um, so the only way you can build confidence in that is is through proper ex ex well and ex doing the exploration. I mean, uh, the sort of things we do when we explore for these resources, you know, understanding the seal potential and the leakage risk understanding the risk of fracture, um, understanding how far the plume will migrate. These are things that are pretty, I think we can, can predict with a fair bit of confidence, uh, but not without data. And that data comes with a big cost tag. And so, you know, the problem you've got now is who, 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 who really thinks we're going to be able to do CCS? Will the money be there? Will the policy support be there? So how do you justify investing in all that exploration and appraisal work today, which is the problem for India and China? So um, I, I, was, I was wondering about how Australia would look on the rapid changes. So um, obviously, if we're talking production side, gigantic. So I was wondering 
uh, whether that also is like an extremely fast um, you know, drawdown in production. Um, on, on, uh, so when, when you say, so yeah, we're, 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 we're sort of a big producer of coal, right? We're not as big as the United States. Sure. Um, where a big 5% of China, um, but we are the world's biggest exporter of, of seaborne trade in coal. So, um, and that's growing. Right? So we, we have a very rapid uptake of solar PV and to a lesser extent wind. Um, we have pretty good uptake of energy efficiency. So within our, bound, within our borders, what's happening is theory looks okay, uh, but we're, ex we're, we're increasing our exports significantly still 5% year on year of thermal coal and uh, natural gas. So, you know, that's, that's the problem. Um, so does it look like the US is small in, in terms of the... Uh, other, than, other than, so we export maybe 80% of our coal and 80% of our natural gas. So we very small very small market ourselves, but, but a big producer of natural gas. And you know, uh, the, there's, a neck, there's a political bottleneck to that changing because it's a big source of revenues for the government and, and a big importer. Uh, but it has to change, doesn't it? Uh, and it'll have dire consequences for the Australian economy, for sure. Go. I'm just wondering about, you know, you're looking at coal retirements and how early you have to bring forward coal retirements, and then talking about CCS as a you know potential way that you could actually extend plant life and lose that, um, avoid you know, having that amount of money you know, essentially lost. What is the trade-off between building a new plant with CCS? Because presumably, if you put CCS on an old plant, maybe it costs more than you know to retrofit than it does to integrate with a new plant. You might be retiring the CCS. You know, aspect of the plant within 20 years instead of integrating with a plant that runs for 40 to 50 years. I mean, do you have a feel for where that financial balance is going to come out? Is it, you know, will developers actually just decide to build a new plant with CCS, or would retrofitting still make financial sense? So, so um, after we killed zero gen in Australia, um, there was a big push to say, well, we can't afford a new, a new CCS project for we'll retrofit. So I just ruled that out as entirely as an option for Australia because our youngest plant was 30 years old uh, and, and the majority are 30, 40, 50 years old. So it makes no sense to retrofit an ageing facility like that uh, as an economic proposition. Um, on the other hand, there's lots of plants in, in you know, most of the plants in China and India are less than 10 to 15 years old. So they have, in theory, uh, Oh, and the normal, and the business as usual circumstances would run another 30, 40 years. So, so it could make sense there. Um, but they're built, they're still building too. I know things have paused and slowed in, in China and India, but certainly in Southeast Asia, we're still building coal plants. Uh, and, and in Japan, we're still building coal plants. There's no CCS potential in Japan, but, but it would make sense in those new plants to really think about, um, particularly in their location, placing them where CCS prospects were real. Um, so I think anything less than 10 years, I'd certainly think was a retrofit proposition. Anything over 20 years was much. So now that creates this interesting point that, for example, the US might not be interested in developing retrofit technology given the age of the plants. Um, you know, countries like Japan may not have an interest because they don't have the geologic capability. So then that again pushes the onus onto a developing country you know, to develop that technology. Yeah, so, so the other thing after the zero gen, um, the, the, the federal government had given us two and a half billion dollars, which, which the plan was to match that with industry funding, uh, and the economics didn't work until it. So I took a proposal to the federal government and said, we should not spend another dollar on CCS develop, uh, demonstration type work in Australia. We should take our two and a half billion, go match it with the Japanese, go match it with the United States, and then go to China with a matching proposal. And not only would, would they uh, be able to build them, but they'd build five at the same price that, that we could build three between us at least, and they could build them quickly. 
And that would I think that would have had a much bigger implication in terms of accelerating CCS and bringing its cost down than any amount of big demonstration <coughs> work done in the US or Europe or, or, or Australia. Um, but political bottlenecks. We don't like sending billions of dollars off to China. Um, well, I want to follow this up actually. What, what's the value of these projections, like the ones you put up earlier? Like, you know, that if, if they were real uh, limits that some government, world government had set, they'd mean something. But they aren't, of course, they're just back to back yeah. projections. Um, if investors believed those projections, they wouldn't build any coal because you wouldn't build a 40-year plan with, a, uh, with, a, with, with an expectation of having it close to that after, after 20 years. So therefore, investors are not believing the projections. So what value do those projections I, My own view is that um, they actually have the opposite of that value. They provide this sense of assurance or optimism that there is a pathway there. Um, which, which actually I think is stopping people recognising the urgency and the difficulty that's involved and the need to get on with something. Um, it sort of creates a false sense of security about what's possible. Uh, and that's one of the things we're hoping if we can, if we can succeed with the project is that we would bring uh, a more realistic view uh, about urgency and about what, what, what's needed um, to the table. Uh, investors you clearly don't believe well, not all anyway. Uh, certainly, I know a good example of this is, is in Australia. Rio Tinto recently divested all their thermal coal assets. Now, this was really driven by the board and its London shareholders, right? Active shareholders putting pressure on them around the carbon exposure. So they put their thermal coal assets, the best thermal coal assets really in the world, on the market. And of course, there was no shortage of buyers. And the, and the buyers were the Chinese and Glencore, the world's biggest exporter of, of thermal coal. And so, you know, it's all the divestment is one of the things I talk about. The divestment um, <coughs> is pushing investors to sell these things. There's always someone else on the other side of the transaction getting these assets cheaply. Uh, and I think realistically, they're getting them cheaply enough that they'll run them longer than Rio Tinto uh, and probably with less environmental stewardship. In Rio Tinto would have ever run. So, so I think these sort of scenarios actually a lull us into a, a sense of security, but but b just let the government off the hook of realising that we really need to do something urgently.